Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, what's up? It's that time. Napoleon's Marshals Part 2. Let's just hop right into it. Uh, not much needs to be said. You guys know the deal. Original video at the top description below. Hope you guys are, guys are doing okay. If you're not subscribed, want to learn about history through YouTube recommendations, join the club, pull up a chair. Let's get right into it, guys. So when was this made? It seems like these were much more recent. October 1st, 2020. Okay, let's do it. And I think I want to start... Uh, I have a Hannibal Carthage Second Punic War playlist. I can do that after this. Uh, yeah, so let's go. Wake up time. Terror belly. Dick. A lot of people make great points about what my... Uh, the, I, I did make the connection of like, uh, well, think about if it was an American flag, you wouldn't want the enemy to um, to take that. And that was a good point. Um, I, I just, if I if I had a bunch of American flags and I knew the enemy was coming, my, my first thought wouldn't be to burn all of them so they couldn't burn them. It's just something that I can't understand, obviously, how important uh, these things were to these people, obviously, and it was a great... Um, dishonor and shame if they ever fell into enemy hands and so they had to burn them. That completely makes sense. Uh, guys, thanks for uh, clarification, the help. Uh, let's let's go. Cus Pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. In France, the title of marshal or maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. Maybe I would rather burn them than let them burn them. I'm, I'm letting that take up too much of my thinking All right 26 now. have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals, with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Port, former Chief Historian of the French Army. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Bonyatovsky, and Jourdan. Before we begin, a big thanks to our video sponsor, Displate. For those who don't know, Displate make exceptional metal posters that allow you to decorate your home with unique collectible artwork that reflects and Mag cool. is also at work Alexander the Vin Comics and the great history role-playing game Kingdom Come Deliverance. Display to 10 million to get 27 cent off on 18. 18. Marshal Bernadotte. Bernadotte enlisted in the French Royal Army, aged 17, and proved a model soldier, rising to become the senior non-commissioned officer in his regiment in just 10 years. The French Revolution and active service opened the door to rapid promotion. He was made an officer, and thanks to exemplary leadership and courage, rose in rank from captain to general of division in a single year. Not even Napoleon rose through the ranks as quickly. Yeah, the other guy, I forget his name, was in there for like 20, 25 years and was only ever up to captain in that point, and this guy exceeded that. He distinguished years. himself at Fleurus, leading an attack that helped secure Jourdan's famous victory. As a professional soldier and ex-sergeant major, Bernadotte insisted on the highest standards of discipline and conduct from his men. He even fought a duel with his own chief of staff, whom he accused of taking a bribe. In 1797, 
discipline and conduct from his men. He even fought a duel with his own chief of staff, whom he accused of taking a bribe. In 1797, Bernadotte was transferred to Italy, where he served under Napoleon's command for the first time. By this stage, both men had brilliant reputations, but despite a good first meeting, a clash of styles and jealous rivalry soon emerged between them. What's more, Bernadotte had immediately got on the wrong side of the future Marshal Berthier, Napoleon's chief of staff, by arresting one of his friends for insubordination. In 1798, Bernadotte married Napoleon's ex-fiancée, Désirée Clary. Her sister Julie was married to Napoleon's brother, Joseph, meaning Bernadotte was now family. But when Napoleon asked Bernadotte to support his coup of 18 Brumaire, he refused, though he did not actively oppose it. Napoleon suspected Bernadotte of conspiring against him, but the Clary sisters helped to keep the peace. Throughout this period, Bernadotte held key posts as Minister of War in 1799, Commander of the Army of the West in 18... All of these guys seem to live really long, like 81, another one was like 87 or something. ...and Governor of Hanover in 1804, proving highly effective in each role. That year, Napoleon made Bernadotte a marshal, and he commanded 1st Corps at the Battle of Austerlitz, playing a relatively minor part in the Emperor's great victory. Nevertheless, he was... I had to go take a piss quick. Bathroom break. Okay. ...rewarded with the title in the Emperor's great victory. Nevertheless, he was rewarded with the title Prince of Ponte Corvo. Wait, it's sorry. ...playing a relative marshal, and he commanded 1st Corps at the Battle of Austerlitz, playing a relatively minor part in the Emperor's great victory. Nevertheless, he was rewarded with the title Prince of Ponte Corvo. But his relationship with Napoleon remained difficult. In 1806, as Napoleon took on Prussia, Bernadotte was blamed for failing to support Marshal Davout at the Battle of Auerstedt, and was nearly court-martialed. Though Bernadotte partly redeemed himself with a vigorous pursuit of the beaten Prussians. The next year, he missed the Battle of Eylau, after his orders were intercepted by the Russians, and a gunshot wound to the neck meant he also missed the Battle of Fr I want all of these paintings in my room. Friedland, with command of 1st Corps passing to General Victor. When war resumed with Austria in 1809, Bernadotte was given command of the 9th Saxon Corps. On the evening of the first day at the gigantic Battle of Wagram, his troops were in heavy fighting with the Austrians. But dressed in white, like the Austrians, they came under friendly devastating fire. friendly fire, panicked and routed. Not the best, uh... The next morning, Bernadotte pulled his men back without orders. And when they later Colors retreated days. again, he and the Emperor exchanged sharp words on the battlefield. Bernadotte then issued a proclamation to the Saxons, praising their conduct. On the day of 5th of July, 7,000, 8,000 of you had pierced the center of the enemy army and moved to Vagram in spite of the efforts of 40,000 men supported by 50 cannons. And outraging Napoleon. Bernadotte was sent in semi-disgrace to the Dutch coast to oversee the defeat of a major British landing at Valkyrie. But another triumphant proclamation, effectively publicizing the strength of his forces, further infuriated Napoleon. In an unlikely twist of fate in 1810, Swedish politicians invited Bernadotte to become Crown Prince of Sweden. The current king was old and childless, and Bernadotte was a proven general and administrator, member of the French imperial family, and well regarded by Swedish army officers, who remembered his fair treatment of Swedish prisoners three years earlier in Pomerania. Wow. Napoleon. Imagine that having so much respect for even when they had uh, your enemies uh, or your country's soldiers were treated so well by this person and 
you have respect for them even though they're on the uh, enemy team at the time. He was at first bemused, remarking that he could think of other marshals who were better qualified, but he did give his assent. Napoleon, the Napoleon classic. Even when Bernadotte made it clear that as crown prince, he would pursue Swedish interests. He was true to his word. Three years later, yep. with Napoleon on the ropes after his disastrous invasion of Russia, Crown Prince Bernadotte brought Sweden into the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. With his insider knowledge, he helped the Allies to devise the Trachenberg Plan, a strategy for defeating Napoleon in Germany by avoiding battle with Napoleon himself and targeting only his marshals. Wow, 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 wow. You know, smart, great idea. Obviously, he has the insider knowledge. That must have been a huge asset. In September, Bernadotte defeated former comrades, Marshals Udino and Ney, at Denevitz. Five weeks later, he played a major role in the great Allied victory at Leipzig. That Bernadotte's was a crazy episode. Proved the most lasting of any of Napoleon's marshals. The royal house of Bernadotte sits on the Swedish throne to this day. Really? Wow. Bernadotte was labeled a traitor His throne. Great, 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 great grandson. To this day. Bernadotte was labeled a traitor by Napoleon's supporters, though not by Napoleon himself. Do you guys know that uh, I think it's President Tyler? I think. Uh. Is it Tyler? Or is it William Henry Harrison? I gotta find it. Like, one of the early presidents has a uh, grandson who's still alive. A grandson. Not a great, great, great grandson. I need to find it, guys. Uh, um... I bet it'll be right here. Oh, he died. Uh, it's... Oh, so there's still one grandson to the 10th president of the United States because he, I'm sorry, this is so off topic. It just came into my mind. I got to say it before I, yeah. Uh, so he was the 10th president or something. Yeah. So 10th president, John Tyler, you guys can skip forward. If you're not interested in this, press the arrow key forward until uh, I'm back to the reaction. I, I just really got to find this. So he was born in 1790, right? He was old enough to have, he could have fought in these wars uh, had he been, you know, if uh, he went in, what, they probably let him in at like 16, 17. And his grandson is still alive because he had a kid at like 71 and then that, his son had a son at like 75 or something like that. And that uh, this grandson's still alive. All right, sorry about that. I just, yeah. He was unquestionably that's crazy. a gifted soldier and administrator. Off topic. I'm sorry. He was unquestionably a gifted soldier and administrator, but his personality clash and long-running feud with the emperor meant he was never a great marshal. Seventeen, Marshal Augereau. Augereau had, by his own account, an eventful younger life, serving at various times with the French, Russian and Prussian armies, deserting or being kicked out of all three in dubious circumstances. He briefly earned How a living dubious. in Dresden as a fencing master, with a feared reputation as a duelist. He embraced the French Revolution and joined a volunteer cavalry regiment known as the German Legion before holding various staff and training roles where his experience in the regular Prussian army proved valuable. Promoted to general, Augereau served in the Eastern Pyrenees, where his flair for tactics and bold, decisive action helped win a series of victories over the Spanish. Later serving in Italy under Napoleon, Augereau proved a highly effective divisional commander. 
The future emperor's reports were glowing. Strong character, firmness, energy, has the habit of war, liked by his men and lucky. In 1796, Augereau played a leading role in Napoleon's victories over the Austrians at Castiglione and Arcole. In fact, the painting of Augereau's heroism at Arcole Bridge long predates the more famous version by Verne, in which Napoleon takes center stage and is an even greater work of fiction. Augereau's standing among fellow generals, however, was damaged by an enthusiasm for looting. He's got one hell of a schnoz there. Nice. To rival General Brune, while others were irritated by his loud and boastful manner. Augereau was known to be a reliable Republican, and in 1797, Napoleon sent him to Paris to be the military muscle for the coup of 18 Fructidor. This was an army-backed purge of pro-royalist politicians threatening to restore the French monarchy. A brief spell in charge of the Army of the Rhine demonstrated that Augereau was not suited for high command, as his unruly entourage and obsession with plunder caused chaos at headquarters. As a Republican... So he's the opposite of Suchet. I know you guys are getting on me for expecting Suchet. All right, I get your point. General Marshall, okay. Giro initially opposed Napoleon's seizure of political power, but soon ah. sensed which way the wind was blowing and pledged support. Created a marshal in 1804, status, wealth, and declining health served to mellow Augereau's behavior. He commanded 7th Corps in the 1805 campaign, but was held in reserve and missed the great battles of Ulm and Austerlitz. The following year, he was in the thick of the fighting at Jena, leading 7th Corps against the Prussian southern flank. At Eylau in 1807, Augereau was so ill he had to be strapped to his horse, but led 7th Corps into battle in terrible winter conditions. Ordered to battle in terrible winter conditions. Imagine seeing that amount of soldiers that close up on battlefields. Ordered to advance, his corps lost its way in a blizzard, was mown down by Russian guns, charged and virtually destroyed. Augereau himself was hit and crushed under his own horse. He returned to France to recover, but was never the same again. His energy and zeal were gone. During Napoleon's war in Spain, he was sent to replace Saint-Cyr as commander of the Army of Catalonia. He completed the grim seven months like of Girona, but was soon replaced by MacDonald for his lackluster performance. In 1812, Augereau commanded depots and reinforcements in the rear, as the Grande d'Armée marched to its destruction in Russia. However, at Leipzig, he was briefly back to his best, inspiring his small corps of conscripts to fight for several key villages in the south in the face of relentless Austrian attack. In 1814, Napoleon gave Augereau command of the Army of the Rhone, but he surrendered Lyon without a fight, and on news of Napoleon's abdication, denounced his former emperor as a man who, having sacrificed millions of victims to his cruel ambitions, has not known how to die like a soldier. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, Augereau proclaimed his loyalty once more, but the emperor was not interested. Augereau was stripped of his baton and died the next year. <laughs> I mean, it's not funny him dying, it's just <coughs> the... Just the twist of events of him being like, yeah, that, I hated that guy. Oh, you're back. Oh, yeah, hey, man, you're great. Oh, hey. Uh, what, what's that you said about me? Later, and then he dies a year later. That's crazy. 16. Marshal Lefebvre.
With Realtor.com's flood zone feature, we found the perfect home in an extremely dry climate. Because too much water will kill us. But we're safe. Francois Lefebvre was a sergeant with 16 years service in the elite Garde Française when the French Revolution broke out. When the Guard was disbanded, he became an officer in the Paris National Guard and received the first of many wounds protecting the royal family from an angry mob. Every inch the soldier, the Revolutionary Wars brought Lefebvre opportunity for active command and rapid promotion. In just two years, he rose from captain to general, establishing a reputation as a formidable divisional commander, a good tactician, brave, energetic, and attentive to the needs of his men. His chief of staff, the future Marshal Soult, acknowledged that he learned much from Lefebvre's example. In 1799, Lefebvre commanded the Paris military district. Not much impressed by politicians, when Napoleon asked him to support a coup, he was all for it, declaring, yes, let's throw the lawyers into the river. In 1804, Napoleon made Lefebvre an honorary marshal. Honorary because Napoleon assumed Lefebvre would prefer a quiet life in the Senate after a decade's active service with the scars to prove it. But he'd underestimated Lefebvre, who pleaded for a frontline role. Yeah, why would, why would he see that? I mean, obviously, he was such a great soldier. He's not just doing it so that he can have time off in his later years or whatever. And uh, I don't know why Napoleon wouldn't think that this guy isn't just uh, born a soldier and wants and does what he does because he loves fighting, I suppose, or loves war, battle. So the emperor gave him command of the Imperial Guard Infantry for the Jena campaign. The next year, Lefebvre commanded the siege of Danzig, inspiring the troops of 10th Corps by leading one counterattack in person. After the successful... Con Sorry. ...conclusion of the siege, Napoleon awarded Lefebvre the title Duke of Danzig. Lefebvre's record as a corps commander was mixed. In Spain, he exasperated Napoleon by twice ignoring orders. But in 1809, when Archduke Charles of Austria launched a sudden attack on Bavaria, Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps was crucial in slowing the enemy advance, until Napoleon arrived to take charge. He was then given the difficult task of suppressing a popular revolt in the Tyrol, led by Andreas This Hoffer, guy is my favorite marshal so far. Which he achieved despite some early setbacks. For the invasion of Russia, Lefebvre commanded the infantry of the Old Guard. During the retreat from Moscow, the 57-year-old marshal insisted on marching on foot at the head of the guard all the way. He's just a soldier's soldier. At the end of the retreat, he was devastated to learn that his son, a 27-year-old general, was among nearly 100,000 men who had not survived the march. He had been Lefebvre's last surviving child of 14. What? After a year recovery. 14 boys? I mean, uh, uh, do they all die in the Napoleonic Wars? There's no way you had 14 boys without a girl. Maybe the girls died in childbirth or young or something like that. Bring from exhaustion and grief, Lefebvre returned to lead the old guard one last time in the defense of France and was in heavy fighting at Montmiral and Montereau. But in April 1814, he was one of the marshals who confronted Napoleon with the reality of his position and forced him to abdicate. Lefebvre and his wife, an ex-washerwoman turned duchess, were famous for their lack of airs and graces, for honest, blunt speech, and for always helping out old comrades. All right, this guy is commented awesome. on Lefebvre's wealth and titles, the marshal invited him into the courtyard. I'll have ten shots at you with a musket at thirty paces, he told him. If I miss, the whole estate is yours. 
When the friend declined, the Fevre added, I had a thousand bullets fired at me from closer before I got all this. Le Fevre was too exhausted to take an active role in the Waterloo campaign, though he accepted a role as a senator under Napoleon, which led to a brief... He's just such a soldier, like, <laughs> even it's like, no, man, I'm good. Like, uh, like, <laughs> you're just hanging out, like, having some beers. <laughs> I'll give you this whole house if you let me shoot at you 10 times, 30 paces away, and I don't hit you, the house is yours. I, I just wanted to have a drink and chill. Oh, you don't want it, man? It's like, no, I'm good. He's like, well, I got shot at like a million times, okay? <laughs> period in disgrace when the Bourbons returned. Which led to a brief period in disgrace when the Bourbons returned. His rank and honors were restored to him a year before his death in 1820. 15. Mortier. Marshal Mortier. Mortier. Jesus. The three best of my generals were Devout, Salt, or Devot, Salt, and Bessier. Mortier was the most feeble. Edouard Mortier was from a prosperous middle-class background in northern France. When the French Revolution began in 1789, he killed an assassination attempt. Volunteered for the National at Guard, 67. a new middle-class militia charged with preserving order and defending against counter-revolution. When war broke out with France's neighbors, Mortier's unit was sent to the front. Standing six foot four, Mortier was conspicuous for his height and bravery, being wounded twice and winning praise from his commander, the future Marshal Lefebvre. In 1799, Mortier fought under General Massena's command at the Second Battle of Zurich, helping to defeat the Russians and winning promotion to the rank of General of Division. Mortier then spent three years commanding the Paris military district. His I feel like 6'4 is almost like too tall if you're a soldier. I think if you're a soldier, like six feet might be a good height because in melee combat and, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat or, you know, with muskets or uh, bayonets, you might have a, an advantage with your height and strength and size, uh, but you're also a bigger target. So 6'4 might just be a little uh, excess target area. His efficiency impressed the new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte. Why does the horse look so sad? An important mission in 1803. The occupation of Hanover, a German state belonging to the Hanoverian kings of Britain, with whom France was, once more, at war. Mortier carried out this assignment with tact and diplomacy, ensuring the occupation was unopposed. This delighted Napoleon, who rewarded him a year later with the rank of Marshal. Following Napoleon's victory over the Austrians at Ulm in 1805, Mortier and his new 8th Corps led the pursuit of the retreating Russians, but became encircled by a much larger force at Durenstein. Mortier fought his way out of the trap with a nighttime bayonet charge, a remarkable escape, but his corps suffered heavy losses. Mortier and 8th Corps were in a supporting role for the Jena campaign of 1806. But the next year at Friedland, his corps played an important role holding Napoleon's left wing, as the Emperor inflicted a devastating defeat on the Russians. Mortier was well liked by all, and almost uniquely did not engage in feuds and rivalries with the other marshals. Houdinot was a particular friend. In East Prussia, their party trick was to snuff out the candles with pistol shots. They always paid generous compensation for damage caused. In 1808, Mortier joined Napoleon. What the hell, man? You just. Eh, I'll give you like a thousand. What is it, Frank's gold pieces or something? Napoleon for the invasion of Spain. And come on. I love this picture because the guy uh, with the cross and just going to town. It almost. 
Looks like Gandalf. <laughs> oh, Balrog, you now you shall not pass. Uh founded Fifth Corps at the brutal siege of Saragossa. He then helped win a series of victories over Spanish forces, including the crushing victory at Ocaña. Operate Okay, so the Z at the beginning is is pronounced like a Z in English, but then the Z at the end is like a TH, the Zaragoza. Siege of Zaragoza. He then helped win a series of victories over Spanish forces, including the crushing victory at Ocaña, operating alongside another friend, Marshal Soult. I feel like you guys just know I love Suchet, and he's not, he like wasn't a marshal at the time, or was a general or whatever, you're getting on my ass about that. And you're like, don't worry, he'll, he'll come up in the Marshal series. I feel like you're just messing with me, and he's just never gonna come. Mortier was recalled to France to organize and train the Young Guard a new junior unit of the Imperial Guard, made up of the best conscripts from each year's intake. Mortier led the Young Guard in Russia in 1812, but was powerless to prevent the Corps' destruction on that campaign. First through exhaustion and disease on the march to Moscow, then on the retreat, where his surviving troops were effectively sacrificed to hold open the road at Krasny and allow the army's escape. Mortier continued to command the Young Guard during Napoleon's campaigns in Germany and France, and was never far from the action. At Lützen, he was trapped under his wounded horse, was in heavy fighting at Leipzig, and had his hat shot through outside Paris. In 1814, the final defense of the French capital fell to troops under Mortier and Marmont. I mean, when you have a hat that's like three feet tall. Support from Marshal Monse's National Guard. Mortier told his men, we have not enough troops to resist their large armies for long, but today, more than ever we before, are fighting for we are our fighting honor. for our honor. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, he wanted Mortier to resume his customary role at the head of the Young Guard but a severe attack of sciatica prevented him joining the emperor at Waterloo. Napoleon. Okay. Napoleon never regarded Mortier as suitable for major independent command. Attica prevented him joining the Emperor at Waterloo. Napoleon never regarded Mortier as suitable for major independent command, but his loyalty Yay. and conduct were always beyond reproach. He went on to serve the restored monarchy as ambassador to Russia and briefly minister for war. In 1835, he was riding beside King Louis Philippe in a public parade when an assassin opened fire with a homemade multi-barreled gun. The king received a minor wound, but Marshal Mortier took a public parade when an assassin opened fire with a home king minister for war. In 1835, he was riding beside King Louis Philippe. In okay, I was wondering, I was like, why did it say he was killed at uh, by an assassination attempt? Because if it was an assassination for him, you wouldn't say he was killed by an assassination attempt. You would say he was assassinated, but he was he was killed from the fire that was meant for uh, King Louis. Okay. In a public parade, when an assassin opened fire with a homemade multi-barreled gun, the king received a minor wound, but Marshal Mortier and 17 others were killed. 17 others? 17 others? 17 others? How did he kill 17 other people? Gun. When an assassin opened fire with a homemade multi-barreled gun. A homemade multi-barreled gun. received a minor wound. But Marshal Mortier and 17 others were killed. Yeah, give that assassin a job in the uh, army technology department because he has a good gun. How do you kill that 14. many people? Marmont. 
Yeah, this guy was mentioned a lot. Marmont, like Napoleon, was a trained artillery Let me guess, officer. he died at 106. the future emperor for the first time at the Siege of Toulon, where Napoleon made his name. They formed a friendship, and when Napoleon was given command of the French army in Italy, he took Major Marmont with him as an aide-de-camp. I think there are two episodes I haven't seen at the very beginning. I gotta look at those. Napoleon's early victories in Italy, and was commanding his own artillery regiment by the age of 23. As part of Napoleon's inner circle, Marmont accompanied him on his expedition to Egypt in 1798, fighting in the battles of Alexandria and the Pyramids. Naturally, he backed Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, as Napoleon overthrew the Directory and made himself First Consul of France. Six months later, Napoleon led an army over the Alps into Italy. It was his artillery commander, General Marmont, who figured out how to get the cannon through the mountain passes like using animal. manhold sledges. At the ensuing Battle of Marengo, Marmont's skilled handling of the artillery helped Napoleon to win a decisive victory over the Second Coalition. Two years later, Marmont was made Inspector General of Artillery, working with Napoleon to implement reforms that improved firepower, mobility and supply. Marmont was bitterly disappointed not to be among the first marshals created in 1804. But he was still only you 29, get a baton. You and get a baton. The time was on his side. I mean, it, I gotta shut the up. The first marshals created in 1804. But he was still only 29, and Napoleon assured him that time was on his There's side. There's Joseph. He was further frustrated in 1805, when his corps was sent to guard the army's strategic southern flank, and so missed the great victory at Austerlitz. Saw the one-eyed general. The spoils of that war included Dalmatia, which Marmont was sent to govern in 1806. Though he lived in extravagant luxury, his reforms and infrastructure projects were so effective that even the Emperor of Austria later admitted, it's a great pity that Marmont was not in Dalmatia two or three years right, longer. Is he the one who went back to the Kingdom when of Naples? When war broke out with Austria again in 1809, Marmont marched north with 11th Corps to join Napoleon near Vienna. But at the Great Battle of Wagram, his troops remained in reserve, while the other corps were engaged in ferocious fighting. At last, an opportunity to prove himself came as Napoleon ordered him to pursue the retreating Austrians. But reckless over-enthusiasm nearly led to disaster at Znaim. A week later, Napoleon created three new marshals, MacDonald, Oudinot, and Marmont. MacDonald for France, it was said, Oudinot for the army, Marmont for friendship. Napoleon then rather undermined the moment That's by telling Marmont, cool. between ourselves, you've not yet done enough to justify my choice. His big chance. Napoleon seems like such a logical guy. Like, he seems like he he doesn't always let his emotions get in front of him, and even when someone betrayed him or something, he, he points out their positives or something, and he... I just gained so much for Napoleon, so much respect for Napoleon throughout these videos. This came in 1811, when he was sent to Spain to replace Marshal Massena. But Suchet. after a promising start, and some bold maneuvering against the British on My the boy. Douro River, he stumbled into disaster at Salamanca. Marmont himself was an early casualty of the battle, badly wounded by a shell burst and carried from the field. As I always forget that right. casualty doesn't mean death, it, it means only. death or injury, or anything that takes you out of battle. After convalescing in France, Marmont was back with the Grande Armée in 1813, as Napoleon battled to save his empire. He commanded 6th Corps throughout the campaign in Germany, fighting at Lützen, Bautzen and Dresden. At Leipzig, he held the northern sector with skill and determination, making Blücher's Prussians pay a high Leipzig price. Leipzig was a crazy for the episode. Marmont played an important role in Napoleon's. Eight that one in the retreat from Russia might have been my two favorite. 1814 defense of France, 
shadowing Blücher's movements along the Marne River and guarding the road to Paris. But by now, he was showing signs of exhaustion and disillusion. At the Battle of Long, he allowed his corps to be surprised by the enemy, with heavy loss. Napoleon's stinging criticism may have been the moment that ended Marmont's loyalty. He was the senior marshal in Paris when the Allies attacked on the 30th of March. After a day's fighting and facing inevitable defeat, he negotiated the city's surrender. Five days later, with Napoleon at Fontainebleau still planning to march on Paris, Marmont marched his corps over to the Allied lines and surrendered. Napoleon was shocked at this Must betrayal by one of his back. oldest comrades. He'd already been persuaded that he must try to abdicate in favor of his three-year-old son. Now he accepted that he must abdicate without conditions. Whether Marmont acted to save lives... Like, it seems like Napoleon, I could be completely wrong, obviously, but I feel like even if he got his hands on Marmont, like, say he, he won, like, the battle, like, taking over Paris and got Marmont as a prisoner... Like, I'm not even sure Napoleon would execute him or anything. I feel like he would just show him, like, disappointment and then just, like, send him somewhere. I could be wrong, obviously. Out of self-interest or spite, or a combination of all three, remains the subject of heated debate. Like, I'm more disappointed than mad. He was well rewarded by the restored Bourbon king, and never forgiven by Bonaparte loyalists. As military commander of Nicknamed Perfect Given by the Bonaparte, Judas Company, Marmont Jeez. could not prevent the next revolution and had to flee France. Ooh, I gotta he learn about that. Not As military commander of Paris in 1830, Marmont could not prevent the next revolution and had to flee France. He spent the rest of his life in exile, becoming tutor while he was in Vienna to Napoleon's son, the Duke of Reichstadt. Died he was the last of Napoleon's marshals to die in Venice in 1852. If you go look at my TikTok, I have some videos of, uh, or just on YouTube, of, I think it's so cool seeing uh, early photos of people. They were uh, fighters in the American Civil War uh, talking on video, very grainy, obviously, in like 1920. And it's just crazy to see photos of old people i know right here there's not you can't see any person like photos of old people like who lived a long time ago who are also old at the dawn of uh this technology of photography and so like they experienced things like stuff like napoleonic wars like that those photos of the um last uh napoleonic war veterans when uh photography came around i think it's so cool bernadotte augereau lefebvre Mortier Marmont. 13 down, 13 to go. Join us for part three when we'll continue the countdown coming soon. Thanks again to our Thank video you. sponsor. Such a good video, like always. They keep getting better. Uh, Epic History TV is such a great, my favorite channel, bar none. Such a great channel. Um, all right, guys. I will see you guys next time. Later. Hope you're doing good.